Hi, I'm super excited to introduce to you Mark Laurie. I'm excited, Mark, to have this conversation. Thanks for coming in. Me too, Michael. Awesome. I want to spend time today talking about really two or three things. Okay. One, you as an entrepreneur. I want people to know who you are, where you've come from, your roots in Staten Island, and really how you've gotten to where you are today. There's so many people out there that want to be entrepreneurs themselves and that get inspired and excited by stories like yours, and I'd love to share it. And the second thing is, as many people know, Yield Street is one of the exclusive investors in Wonder Series B, alongside some of the world's, I would say, most formidable or largest investors, NEA, Google Ventures, Forerunner, and others. And to me, it's an opportunity to share with people who would never have a chance to be able to participate in your success. So I want them to know what Wonder is, why you're excited about it, and why they should be as excited to invest in it as we at Yield Street are. So um, let's jump right into it. Mark, you grew up in Staten Island. Tell us your story. Yeah, I grew up in Staten Island. Um, <clears throat> my, my parents had me when they were young, 20 years old. I was the f first of, of three kids. And uh, you know, we grew up very modest means. Um, my mom, uh, you know, didn't finish high school. My dad, um, you know, was was sort of a scrappy, trying to make trying to make a buck. Started selling vacuum cleaners door to door, you know, in Staten Island, and tried his hand in lots of different things. Um, I, from a very young age, was born wanting to be a farmer. Like as early as my uh, parents could remember, I wanted to be a farmer because they grow stuff from nothing. So it was really like born into my DNA of like wanting to build something, build a startup. I, I think I had, they say, you know, is it, is it something you're born with? I, th I think part of it is, yes. Like I wanted to, wanted to build stuff as a kid. And I did every entrepreneurial business you could think of, car washes, baseball cards, newspapers, recycling, weeds, snow, anything, you know, that was somewhat entrepreneurial. But when I went to, um, went to college, uh, and graduated, there really wasn't this idea you can go work for a startup. I had no access to capital. There wasn't really startups back in, in 93 that, that were not like it was to, you know, later on, a few years later. So I went to work in a bank and uh, was, was working in banking for like seven years, six and a half, seven years, and doing really well, making a lot of money, didn't feel fulfilled, and just had this yearning to like want to build something and be an entrepreneur. And one day I just woke up and I just said, I'm quitting. I'm quitting banking. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. People said, like, you're crazy. You're crazy. You don't have an idea. I just had a newborn family making a lot of money. And like, what are you going to do? What's your idea? And I said, I, I just, I know I need to go do this. And so I walked into my boss's office and I said, you know, I'm quitting. And he laughed at me and he said, go back to work. And I'm like, no, no, I'm really, I'm quitting. I'm, he's like, you don't have an idea. You don't have any money. You can't just quit. How are you going to? pay the bills. And I said, well, I saved some money. Thank you for paying me so well. Um, and he said, you're, you're going to do this, aren't you? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do this. He's like, can I put 50 grand in? <laughs> Cause I think you're going to, I think this, you're going to make something of this. So he gave me 50 grand and that was sort of the first 50. And, uh, and that was back in, I guess it was 90, late 99, 2000. Um, so I, I chose to do my first startup right before the big crash of the NASDAQ. Which was which is a fun experience. Perfect timing. Perfect. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> great, great wake up call. So you know, I, I think a, a common theme that I've come across a lot of entrepreneurs is where they've grown up and their parents in different ways. Do you think that being a kid from from Staten Island, from New York City, um, a child of a serial entrepreneur, if you will? A hustler in a different way. Hustler, that's a good word, yeah. I just, do you think that grit is something that, that has been sort of a part of your DNA? You say you were born with it. I always wonder how much is nature versus nurture? I'm like, what I the think, balance I think, is? well, it's definitely seen the, the hustle in my, in my dad growing up. There's no question that rubbed off on me. But also the risk taking. So, you know, it was always about taking risk and failing. I watched my dad fail at a million things. And so it just became very much like, yeah, you go for it, you fail, it's okay, it's not a big deal. Like, you know, kids today, um, it's just tough. You know, you, you get on the right track, you get A's, 
then you go to school and you get A's again. And it feels like life is really planned. Yeah, for and everything, people. everything. You, you just why take risk? Like you, you're used to like getting A's and performing, and there's no reason to like risk that. And to be an entrepreneur, that's what it's all about. It's basically taking low probability shots with big outcomes. So by definition, when you go into something, um, there's a higher probability of failing than not. And you have to be comfortable with that. And then, of course, you hustle and work your butt off to make the odds better. But Emotionally, how do you do it? Like if you're, if you're talking to other entrepreneurs and they're saying, hey, Mark, like I'm in a similar situation as you were in in 92. I know I'm going to hit some bumps in the road. I know I'm going to have failures. Yeah. How do you deal with them? Yeah, I mean, I, I tell people, like, you have to be prepared to put yourself in a position where you can't afford to fail because that's the only way that you can, like, draw that, what I call, sixth gear out of yourself. Like, so many times I was pushed to the actual absolute limit where it was easy to just give up and say, you know what, this is too hard or it's not going to work but I always put myself in a position where I couldn't afford to fail. Like when I did my first startup, I put $390,000 into the company. And people say, why 390, why not 400? I said, because that's all I had. I literally, bank account said 390, boom. And you can say that's crazy. It's not something you would like recommend, but there is no way I could afford to lose that money. And I basically did and ran through, ran through brick walls, you know, to make sure that didn't happen. Then the next company, you know, did a similar sort of thing. And then after I made money, they said, well, what do you do now? You already made all this money, so how do you put yourself in that position? Well, you get every friend, relative, family member, aunt, uncle, people mortgage their house to put their money into your startup. You can't lose same it. thing. <laughs> it's the same thing. So, I love that. So yeah. just. Put yourself in a position that winning is the only Can't be option. comfortable, yep. Yeah. You cannot ever give yourself a plan B or an exit strategy or if this doesn't work out, I'll be okay. If you're saying that to yourself as an entrepreneur, like, listen, I guess if this doesn't work out, I'll be fine. You don't even start. Don't even, once you go down that path, you'll just take it. It's, it's, it, can't even, it can't even be on the option set. And I've never had that. It's, it's always been like, no, I, if this doesn't work, like, it's as good as being dead. Like, that is the feeling. That's what it feels like. It's the like. level of intensity yeah, you bring. Yeah, the level of intensity. It. And, and you got to be prepared to work 100 hours a week. You have to be prepared to have, like, deal with incredible uncertainty. Um, and you have to be able to take risk. And, and you have to be able to, like, fail, fail really fast, and just move ahead. And if you're the kind of person that dwells on something that went wrong, forget it. Like, you're, you're done. If you're the kind of person that worries about something that might happen, forget about it. Like you just, you can't. So that's what it is, right? I mean, it's just like, you're one of the most prolific <laughs> entrepreneurs and startup founders and operators in our generation, right? There's Quincy, there's jet.com, there's diapers.com, there's Walmart online, there's Amazon in there. You've built some amazing companies. And I know in some of our conversations, you talk about having people join you in each venture that I've been with you in either a prior venture or even more than one. Yeah. And so it, it seemed to me, and we didn't have this particular conversation, but it seemed to me that there's a particular culture that you're focused on building in your organizations that is intoxicating and brings people back. What is it? What, how would you describe it? And how do you build it? Yeah. I mean, first of all, there's nothing more important that I've learned throughout my entrepreneurial career as building um, a great culture that really attracts, more than just attracts, attracts, retains, and gets the best out of the best people. Like that, then you know you've got something. Like if, if, you've, if you've got a place or a company that the best people want to come work and they want to give you the best they've got, you can't, you can't beat that, right? No. So, um, so it all starts with, with having a, a set of values and knowing the kind of culture you want to create and then living those values like no other company. Um, and that's, that's sort of the, the, the fundamental foundational piece is sort of the values. And then it's the, the traits, the character traits of the people that you hire as well. So it's the, the values that the company lives and then the character traits. And it, you know, at, at Jet.com, for example, 
Uh, we were well known for the three values that we stood for, which were trust, transparency, and fairness. And the reason why we chose those three values is because all three of them um, working together, people found super empowering and inspiring. Like, I trust you implicitly. I'm transparent. Here's all the information you need. And I'm going to create a really fair, you know, safe work environment where you feel like you can bring your best self to work. Like, that's a real good recipe to give it the best you've got, feel empowered. And, and then you couple that with hiring people that share these what I call spotic traits, which are the seven traits that, that I look for in, in people that are uh, coming to my startups. And it's basically uh, smart, passionate, optimistic, tenacious, adaptable, kind, and empathetic. Those are sort of the traits I look for and with a strong emphasis on, on kindness and empathy. So you'll find a lot of people in startups that have passion, that are optimistic, tenacious, but they're not necessarily bringing people along. Um, and I think there's that soft side the, of being kind and treating people right and um, being empathetic that really rounds out um, the I like the that traits, a lot. You know? You know what I think maybe a little bit of it is because you, you mentioned your earlier part of your career in banking. Um, I find that banking doesn't always have as many people that are focused on the, those last two traits, kindness and empathy. There are certainly many that do. I think the nugget in the startup world particularly is ultimately the requirement or the need to be really collaborative in our work. Mm -hmm. And you you just can't be your best collaborative self if you don't have empathy and kindness. Yeah. When it's just you, when it's you against you, and you're an individual contributor, or you're a trader, yes. you can sit behind your desk, you can sit in your office, you can go crush it, and you don't need to take people along with you. Yeah. When you have this big, tall mission and this huge vision, and it requires bringing together technology, product, data, marketing, compliance, whatever else is there, you need that, that empathy to be able to work together as a team a yeah, lot. Yeah, it's true. And, and even you know, the, the younger generations are, are, I think, respecting this more than any generation before. Um, they want to be treated you know, with respect. And that's the way you get the best out of people. You, know, you, you treat them you know, well, respect them, um, trust them, empower them. Um, they'll give you the best they've got. And that's where the magic happens. Like I, you can find companies that hire great people, but they can't retain them or if they retain them, but they don't get the best they've got. And you sort of, you know, everyone's been there, you know, where you, you know you've got more to give in a company, but you're like, nah, they don't care. Like, why should I care? Like that kind of attitude. But if you, if you get a really good person and you bring it into, in, them into a company where they feel inspired by the mission and the values, and they're motivated to want to give the very best they've got, that's the X factor. And I've been fortunate, like, have learned that, you know, a couple startups ago and, and to keep refining it, you know, with the, with, the, with the latest startups. But that's the magic. The whole, the whole thing comes down to, to vision capital people, I say VCP. And, uh, and the hardest part is the, is the people side, people. you know. So bring, bring that to today, I think, um, there's like an interesting sort of set of foundational components. It's this, um, it's kind of in your DNA from the days you wanted to be a farmer to your dad being a hustler. I think the lesson that you learned from him about failing fast and just hustle the next thing is so valuable in, in our world in, in building startups. So you have like this, this calling, if you will, this responsibility to like the universe to build amazing things. Yeah. You know how to find great people, but more importantly, you know how to get them to give 110% of what they have to build amazing companies. Yeah. You have been incredibly successful um, in every way from building life-changing businesses to financially successful to having a ton of fun you're the co-owner of an NBA team of the Timberwolves. I can only imagine how many people are like, oh my God, what that experience might be like. And running businesses and building businesses is not easy. It takes a lot of energy out of us. 
but you do it again. And we just had the, the opportunity as we started off at the top of the discussion to invest in Wonder in the Series B. Why are you doing it again? Like, what do you need the headache for? What is it about Wonder that's getting you back in the saddle? I mean, first of all, yeah, I just, I love the idea of going back to the beginning of building something from nothing. Um, and basically, like, the fun of seeing that vision come to life. That's what really drives me. And, and the bigger the vision and the more impact you can have on the world, the more motivating it is. And this is by far the biggest vision um, and the most motivated I've ever been. So, like... I'm not driven by the money. I'm driven by the mission itself. And like, um, and we just see an opportunity here to really make a real impact on the world and have fun doing it. Like, what's the vision? I mean, like the, the mission in, in its simplest form is to give people easier access to incredible food. Um, you know, wherever you want it, whenever you want it. So if, um, um, you know, today, some of the younger generations don't cook maybe as much as older ones and they value convenience more and been doing a lot of ordering in of food from, from the delivery aggregators and things from local restaurants and uh, myself doing it as well. Um, it's a, it's the last five, 10 years. It's, it's been going crazy, right? People so Mark, each one of your businesses historically has progressively gotten bigger and bigger and done better and better. And you've invested more in Wonder personally than you have in any of your other businesses. By a big margin. By a big margin. And by the way, even on a percentage of net worth basis. So, and this is you're this you're is, all, in, all this in this one. I'm all in. I think this this is the startup that I've been waiting my whole career for. You know, like I think every startup I've done before this has been learning. Um, and all that learning is sort of getting applied here at Wonder. Like I, I do, I do think this is. Um, this is where it all comes together. This is the big one, and I'm 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 in. I'm working as hard now on this one as I did any other startup. I'm 100 hours a week, like laser focused. I know. I texted you a question the other week, and you wrote all in Wonder. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what about drinks? All in Wonder. Yeah, that's it. I can't. I don't want to be distracted. So the best companies have missions that align people what is the mission of wonder the mission is to is to give people easier access to incredible food i think there's a big big problem in america with people having access to great food um uh, wholesome delicious food it's hard to get um you can get it through these delivery aggregators from local restaurants but um the food is is doesn't travel well um it's one of the reasons why i was really excited to start wonder um, you see that, that Gen Z and millennials, they're, they're putting a higher price uh, on convenience and people are wanting to uh, pay a premium to eat in their own home, not have to cook. Um, but the food degrades quite a bit, you know, going from the restaurant to your home. Um, you're paying a lot of extra money. Uh, the service isn't great. There's a lot of foods that you can't even get because they just don't travel well. And just saw an opportunity to sort of uh, jump on this sort of mega trend of, of eat at home, but do it with sort of a 2.0 customer value proposition that basically can win across all elements of the value prop. It's not often you, you get a chance to do that. Like being able to cook the food in a mobile restaurant right outside your door in a, in a high speed um, impingement oven allows you to have better quality food, hotter, faster, and because that were vertically integrated, cheaper too. So, so I resonate with that a lot. You know, COVID wasn't too long ago. And I think that for many of us who were home during COVID, we still had to work. We were under different levels of stress. The kids were home or your friends were around or whatever the case was and cooking wasn't Cooking wasn't top of mind for a lot of people, and it was fun to try and you know taste all these different restaurants. The quality control though was so inconsistent. Yeah. Sometimes the food came in 10 minutes and it was hot. Sometimes it came in an hour and it was cold. And so, the packaging, the, the toppings on the pizza ended up on the wrong side, or the by the time the steak got to you, the sauce and the salad were mixed in and everything was soggy. 
So I resonate a lot with being someone who actually really enjoys great food, mm. but I feel like as the food aggregator apps have gotten bigger and more successful, the consumer's quality has deteriorated over time. Yeah. So how is Wonder going to work? What is different? What, what does Wonder do? So if I'm on the Wonder app, yeah. and what, first of all, what can I order? Okay. And how are you controlling quality? Okay, so um, we went out and, and scoured the U.S. to find the best representation of every cuisine. Where, where's the best pizza? Where are the best burgers? Where's the best steak? Uh, where's the best barbecue? Um, and we identified these, these restaurants that had this incredible following. And we approached them about buying the rights to the name and to the, the uh, recipes so that we could replicate it on the Wonder platform and be able to bring it to your door in New Jersey today, but in the well, future Like well-known brands or like some well, small everything shop from, somewhere? No, everything from Bobby Flay Steak down to DeFaro Pizza in Brooklyn. You have DeFaro Pizza in Brooklyn? Yeah. So I can go on to Wonder and I could be eating DeFaro Pizza. You could get DeFaro Pizza from Brooklyn. You can get Nancy Silverton's Pizzeria Mozza from LA. You can get Tejas Barbecue from Texas. These are the best. So you, you bought the IP and the restaurants and the recipes yes. and everything you could to give the consumer the exact food and experience that I would get in Tejas Barbecue? Yes, the best. And, and, we, and, we make, and we do taste studies. I hope you have a truck downstairs. We do, <laughs> we, we do taste studies to make sure it is the same or better. And not only um, do we, we don't stop there. So every uh, day we get tons of customer feedback on every meal, on every restaurant taste, temperature, portion size, value, and we're constantly reading the feedback and tweaking the recipe to make it even better. Um, and so, yeah, it just, it just keeps getting better. So I'm on the app. You're on the app. I you've click, got, let's say, DeFaro's Pizza. Yeah, you've got, or let's say, Bobby 20, Flay steak. 20 restaurants yep. to choose from. Um, we've got, let's say, right now, 200 mobile trucks out on the road, 10 trucks per restaurant. So there's 20 restaurants, 10 trucks, 200 total. Um, so you'll pull up, you'll want DeFaro Pizza. It'll say that the DeFaro Pizza truck closest to you is 10 minutes away. You order your pizza, hit send, just like you know on, on other apps where you can kind of see the, the truck coming to you, where it is and where your location is. You'll see it pull up in 10 minutes. Cook the pizza, piping hot. It's not, there's no microwaves or anything. It's actually being cooked in a high speed impingement oven and it's brought to your door, piping hot, right out, right in your driveway, it's cooked. That's amazing. Um, yeah. So I'm and getting restaurant quality food at my house. At restaurant prices. Cooked at my house. Yes. Restaurant prices. So there's no, you know, in these delivery aggregators, you're paying all these extra Huge fees markup, and things. Yeah. There's, no, there's no markup. There's no fees. We're vertically integrated. So people say, man, how do, you, how do you make money doing that? It seems too good to be true. Like, well, there's only one person on the truck. So you have the driver is the person that cooks and brings the stuff to the door. So you got a lot of leverage on that, on that labor there. The stop time, um, meaning the time you pull the truck up, cook the food, bring it to the door, and get back to the truck, you're talking about like 15 to 20 minutes max stop time, and it's coming down. Um, so it's not a ton of like actual time and labor in that part of it. And that's really the magic of wonder. Um, we've spent a lot of money and four years basically on food engineering and food science to be able to cook this incredible high quality food fast. So I want to talk cook, about that. Yeah, we can cook. We cook burger. Burger will cook in two minutes. We can cook a Bobby Flay filet mignon steak to perfect temperature every time in six minutes. We can cook four wood-fired pizzas at the same time in four minutes. Um, so, so I want to talk about that because when we first met and we were talking about Wonder, I remember being shocked to learn how long Wonder's been around but never heard of it. Yeah. And you started to tell me that we're not a delivery company. I was like, well, what are you? And you started to share with me the vision and the mission. And we, we were talking about nine figure investments that you were making in hardware, building the most incredible cooking equipment, yeah. the food science that's going on. We were talking, I remember the particular day was a couple weeks ago. We were talking about the, the avocado testing that was going on to keep avocados fresh for a longer period of time. Days, yeah. right? And I think that as, as a prospective investor in wonder, 
it, it's got to be super interesting to share and to, for us as investors to learn what has Wonder built? Like what else is there besides bringing food to us? How does it all come together? So can you tell us a little bit about what's been going on the last couple of years before you actually brought the trucks to market? Yeah, it's really, it's a, it's a food tech company. So we've built an end to end sort of precision system that includes hardware, software, and food engineering and science and how it all comes together. Um, so it starts in a, in a big central commissary, sort of like a food manufacturing facility where we'll source the food, par cook it or sous vide it, put it into kits in, in um, you know, atmospheric packaging that allows the food to last a period, a period of time so you don't have food waste. Um, they get loaded on these trucks and the trucks are outfitted with software, um, both for the chef uh, on, the, on the road, plus all the routing software, and then all the hardware uh, on the truck itself, um, including you know, this high-speed impingement oven and then all the programming that goes into both the oven itself and the food to, to be able to cook it fast with, with incredible, incredible quality. It's um, amazing. Yeah. The other part that I got really excited about when I was learning more about Wonder is the job growth <clears throat> that you're gonna be able to offer these people. There, I, yeah. I don't, I'd like you to share the story that you told me, if you remember it, about a particular person who gave up his job to come start running a truck and to build his own business through Wonder. Yeah. Do you want to share that? Yeah, yeah. So um, everything we've talked about so far is really about the first party Wonder business restaurants that we've gone out and acquired that we've built on the platform. We also uh, launched what we call Wonder Flex, which gives aspiring restaurateurs or entrepreneurs the ability to create their own mobile restaurant on the Wonder platform. Um, so it's sort of like a, a Shopify for restaurateurs. So we had this, this one uh, young gentleman, Sinan. Um, he wanted to open up a brick and mortar a Boston Birani Indian restaurant up in Boston. And he was looking for funding. And it's expensive. It's, it's risky and expensive to open a restaurant. And then told him about Wonder and said, hey, you know, you could, in a couple weeks, you can be live with Boston Birani in 22 towns in New Jersey for 4000 bucks a month with your name, your menu, and you can do it all. You can cook the food, drive the truck, serve the food, and you're a one-stop shop and make money. And uh, he said, huh, this sounds really interesting. He flew down and did a four-day trial. There's no open flame on this truck. It's all you know, high tech. And you've got the customer reach where somebody can sort of plug in and get an order and only have to drive five or six minutes to the next order and do it every night, all night. That's where you, you, you get That's it what from. I was fascinated by when I thought about it. So I don't know that I ever told you this. I happen to love cooking. I find cooking as like one of my outlets. I just feel like um, being, a, being an entrepreneur and being a founder, there are, different, there are different times where the level of pressure, let's just say, is, is greater than others, to say the least. And um, if you care about food and you want to make something really good, precision is important. And so you're kind of like focused. It's like getting a really good workout in. Yeah. And so I always found that like, if I want to cook that perfect steak or I'm making something that I'm like really excited about, I got to be a hundred percent in. So I get to turn off my phone, put the music on, have a glass of wine. And so I was exposed to like sous vide and other types of cooking. And when I realized what you were doing, it made total sense. Like, yeah, I could cook 150 tomahawk steaks at perfect temperature at 130, 127 have it vacuum sealed, get it on the truck, refrigerate it, have a searing station or this you know, incredible oven and, and literally serve it every on China time. at my door. I mean, every time. it's unbelievable. Yeah. I think um, what, what is super important for me to understand and, and to share is $350 million Series B approximately. Yes. That is a lot of money for a Series B. It's a big valuation. What's next for Wonder? What's the exit strategy as an investor? How are we making money? Yeah. So, I mean, this is, we got probably one more round as we're thinking about it before an IPO. So that would be the C, C round probably in 24 months time, let's say. And, uh, you know, the, the market TAM is massive here. I think that's why, like, when I think about the valuation and people say, oh, the valuation seems like a, a big number for a Series B, but it, it really isn't given the context of how much we raised to date and what the upside is. I think market development is there. Yeah. 
which is a huge advantage. I think sometimes people go out and try to create businesses where there isn't market development yet. And so as an entrepreneur in that scenario, not only do you have to build an incredible product and have to identify product market fit, you then have to really grow adoption. And that could be hard to get people to come along that journey with you. What's really exciting about Wonder is I feel like you've picked a really interesting time to enter this market. It took Uber Eats a long time to be successful and to get people to almost use it as a verb, right? Like when you think of food, you think of DoorDash and Uber Eats. Um, 10 years ago or five years ago, you didn't. It was like, oh, should I order this app? Who's going to like, we were even nervous about who would be delivering the food to our house, right? Like, so market development's there. When, when you look at it and you're doing your numbers, what is the TAM in this market? Talk to us about what's the scale and the rate of growth that you expect to see. And if we're sitting down here in one year from now, where is Wonder? Yeah. So in terms of the TAM, so you know, we're sort of thinking about we're doing to sort of the food and beverage market what Amazon did to retail. So, you know, it's a massive, you know, food and beverage is a massive market um, and expected by 2035 to be about 1.1 trillion on pickup and delivery. So to, if you just look at sort of the trends and, and where things are going, that's a huge market on just pickup and delivery. And the, the question is, um, you know, if this plays out and the vision plays out the way we, we hope it will, what percentage of the market share is reasonable? Amazon has a 50 plus share in growing of e -com. So like you start looking at those numbers, like could you get a 40, 50 share of a trillion dollar market? I think it's possible. Um, like that's certainly, this, this business wonder and food and beverage, I think lends itself more to winner take all than even retail does because Amazon is selling commodity goods. They're selling the same things on Target, on Walmart, on Costco. Everything on wonder is proprietary. You can't get on any other app or anywhere else to Farrah Pizza or Bobby Flay Steak and you certainly can't get it cooked right outside your door hot. So I think there's an opportunity for us to create a super app for mealtime. Anytime you want to eat a meal, you pull up the Wonder app and, and it's food, food, food. You know, a lot of these delivery aggregators and things are starting to move into or have already moved into other categories of commodity goods. And it's more of a delivery platform. We are exclusively focused on, on food and meals and I think there's a really big opening and opportunity there. And I think, um, and being that, I mean, you've held, I mean, you ran Walmart digital, right? And yeah. you sold, uh, what was it? Diapers.com to Amazon. Yes. And yeah. so, you know, the, you know, the inner workings of these businesses. And, and even with that, you know, you see this as an opportunity to really be a category killer and build a $500 billion annual revenue business in the U S yeah, I think it's possible. That's I think amazing. it's possible. Yeah. I think, um, Again, just looking at the order density, like in some of the early town that we went in, we're hitting like 60, 70 percent household penetration. Uh, the market awareness is 95 percent. Like it is. And we're not. When I remember asking you this question, I had asked you, are these affluent neighborhoods? And you said. I said it's a, it's a mix. Yeah. There are affluent neighborhoods and there are very non-affluent neighborhoods. It's a, it's a mix. And everyone's using delivery services and everyone's trying to find better quality, yeah. better quality food. And really just like, I think, yeah, not everybody someone, has to someone's order. Someone's going to make a meme of this, but like <laughs> delicious food. Like people just want to eat really <laughs> good food. <laughs> I mean, and, and also like there's, you don't need to order Bobby Flay, you know, $48 filet mignon steak. There's DeFaro pizza. There's Fred's burgers from Atlanta. There's an incredible barbecue. Like there's lots of options. We've got two family style meals, um, one a Mexican concept and one sort of chicken, fish and steak that will feed a family with leftovers for, you know, a little over $50. Like it's a, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good deal. So, so to wrap this up, one oh, of the wait, reasons just before, we're not, it's not six o'clock yet, is it? Cause I have a hard, hard stop. No, it's a quarter to six. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Howard Schultz. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> need the chief of staff, I'll come with you. <laughs> um, okay, ready? So Mark, to wrap this up, one of the things that was most exciting for me personally in being able to be a part of the Series B and to invest alongside the other investors, very openly and very honestly, was a chance to invest in you. 
there, you can count on, on our hand, founders and entrepreneurs of our generation that have been as successful as you. And so the, the opportunity and the chance to be invested with you is, is an honor. The one question I have is... No pressure, right? <laughs> I, th I think you said I should make sure that you can't yeah, lose. Yeah, I know, I know. Exactly. <laughs> so we're telling this to the world. Yeah, I love it. Tell the world. Um, Let's do it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay.